And then in terms of the content, I'm sure you can imagine that Proust would have quite a lot to say about all of those issues that Ruskin just raised. Uh, in fact, this is one of the passages where the notes that Proust has at the bottom of the page, even in the small footnote size typeface, uh, is longer, more than the Ruskin passage itself I read. He gives you an Emerson quote, he talks about snobbery, he uh, gives you a bunch of other Ruskin passages, and um, he starts really laying out what his version of reading is as opposed to, to Ruskin's. The main difference, which I'm going to summarize very briefly, is that um, Proust rejects the idea that reading is the conversation with the great people that you don't have access to in your everyday life. Uh, one of his arguments is, well, some of us have access to the great people, and reading's better than talking with them. Um, but his deeper argument is about the nature of what reading is, that there's this qualitative difference, that when you're in a conversation, even if it's with you know, Mr. Plato around the corner, you're in a social world, and you're interacting socially with other people um, that has all these problems, whereas when you're reading, you're by yourself, but you're still getting other people's input and other people's thoughts without giving up the special powers that you have in solitude. So that, for Proust, is why reading is very different. Let me read a little bit of Proust now. This is from the second half of On Reading, so the second half of his preface, um, which he spends mostly refuting the book that he's just translated and that you're all about to read. <coughs> and this is the first thing I've translated, other than the word makeshift. Indeed, one of the great and wondrous characteristics of beautiful books, and one which enables us to understand the simultaneously essential and limited role that reading can play in our spiritual life, is that for the author, they may be called conclusions, but for the reader, provocations. We can feel that our wisdom begins where the author's ends, and we want him to give us answers when all he can do is give us desires. He awakens these desires in us only when he gets us to contemplate the supreme beauty which he cannot reach except through the utmost efforts of his art, but by a strange and, it must be said, providential law of spiritual optics, a law which signifies perhaps that we cannot receive the truth from anyone else, that we must create it ourselves. The end of a book's wisdom appears to us as merely the start of our own so that at the moment when the book has told us everything it can, it gives rise to the feeling that it has told us nothing. Moreover, when we ask it questions it cannot answer, we are also asking for answers that would not tell us anything. Because one effect of the love which poets awaken in us is to make us attach a literal importance to things which for them are meaningful due to merely personal emotions. In every picture they paint for us, they seem to give us but a fleeting glimpse of a marvelous place unlike anywhere else in the world, and we want them to make us penetrate its heart. Bring us with you, we wish we could say to Maeterlinck, to Madame de Noailles. And then they quote, he quotes some of these passages. Um, Bring us to all the places on earth which you never told us about in your books, but which you judge to be just as beautiful. We want to go see the field, which Millet shows us in his spring, for painters instruct us the same way poets do. We want Claude Monet to lead us to Giverny on the Seine to the bend in the river that he barely lets us make out through the morning mist. Now, in actual fact, it was purely the chance of friends or relations happening to invite them to pass through here or visit there that made Madame de Noailles, Maeterlinck, Millet, Claude Monet choose this road, this garden, this field, this bend in the river to depict rather than any other. What makes these places seem different to us and more beautiful than anywhere else in the world is that they bear on their surface, like an elusive reflection, the impression they made on a genius. Uh, so he goes on to say, the supreme efforts of the writer like those of the painter culminate in raising only partway 
the veil of ugliness and meaninglessness which makes us incurious about the universe. Then he says to us, look, look, learn to see, and at that very moment he disappears. Such is the value of reading and also what it lacks. To turn it into a discipline in its own right is to give too great a role to what is merely an initiation. Reading is at the threshold of our inner life. It can lead us into that life, but cannot constitute it. So that's at the center of what Proust says about reading as opposed to what Ruskin does. Um, so let's see. There's the, there's the remembrance of past technique moment that he then explains and decodes all of in the footnote, but I want to make sure that I don't go on too long and I have time for questions. So I'm going to come back to that if there's time, but move instead to this issue of Proust's and my uh, approaches to translation. Um, from the beginning, Proust got kind of a bad rap for these translations uh, because he quote-unquote didn't know English. Um, he did get help in terms of getting a literal first draft that he worked and reworked and reworked and um, it is also uh, pretty clearly true that if someone had plopped him in the middle of London he wouldn't have been able to call a cab or order a meal or sort of get by on that level. Um, and in fact, he overheard nasty comments at the publishers when he was dropping it off about how, of course, this translation was going to be terrible because Proust doesn't really know English. Um, Proust's comeback is, I do not claim to know English, I claim to know John Ruskin. <laughs> um, and uh, to me, this is a perfectly reasonable comeback. Um, I should probably say uh, one reason that I've translated books from the four languages Noreen mentioned is that um, I'm not fluent in all of them. I'm not native level fluent in any of them. There are arguments to be had about whether that's okay or not as a translator. Um, and the deeper arguments about what translators are actually doing. Um, much like the situation with uh, Proust's cross-referencing footnotes, um, is the goal to give an objective, scholarly, correct, complete map? Or is the goal uh, instead what Proust's was? Um, Proust actually <coughs> talks about this a little bit in a footnote of the second book. He's, because when Sesame and Lily's uh, in French translation comes out, the library edition, which is the big critical edition of Ruskin in English, has just come out. And so he has this footnote saying, oh, just as the book went to press, this came out, and of course I recalled it and checked everything. But you'll see that I hardly used any of the notes in the library edition anyway. And um, he says, I might as well read it. Readers unacquainted with my preface to the translation of the Bible of Amiens, may perhaps feel that here, as a second commentator, I should have made more use of these references. Other readers who understand what I intend with these translations will not be surprised to learn that I have not done so. These connections to Ruskin's other works, as I see them, are essentially individual. They are a flash of memory, meaning Proust's memory, and nothing more, a glimmer of one sensibility suddenly sparking between two different passages, and the light they cast is not as accidental as it seems. To supplement them with additional artificially contrived connections that have not flashed forth from my own depths would be to falsify the view of Ruskin I am using them to try and give. So he's making very clear now, uh, partly I think his view has changed and developed between the first book and the second book, but uh, he's still making very clear in saying that what he's doing in both books isn't just giving a bunch of uh, academic cross-references, but giving this kind of map of his own mind in its relation to Ruskin's work as a whole. And, um, and so I think the comeback that uh, I don't claim to know English, I claim to know Ruskin, is, is quite a good one. Um, in fact, 
readers have always praised his translations. They were very well received in French uh, when they came out and continue to be praised for capturing the, um, the, the tone and the language and the meaning. And there are a few gotcha mistakes here and there. Um, but uh, he, uh, he said at one point that he wanted his translations to be uh, faithful like love. And that's what they were. Um, so if, if translation isn't trying to give this completely correct scholarly objective academic map, what is it trying to do? He's talked about it in terms of melody. Uh, he said that even before he knew how to write anything, he had a very good ear when he was reading. He could always pick up the melody of whatever author he uh, was reading, and this also enabled him to write pastiches, um, because once you have the tune, the words come by themselves, is what he says. Um, so uh, in, in this kind of strange paradox, um, translation ended up being more writerly for Proust than writing was, in a lot of ways, at least in the pre-remembrance of things past, because he, he said that he did these pastiches to kind of exorcise all these other voices of great French writers. Um, you know, he did, his, he did his Balzac, he did his saint he did his whatever, and got them all out of his system. Um, whereas translating for him was a, a way of learning how to get into a system, get into this kind of interrelation of all the parts that doesn't come out of um, kind of artificially contrived cross-references, but instead is this consistent flashing forth from the depths of what has a kind of consistency only because it's coming from the same place. Um, he says very suggestive things, um, again in a footnote about Ruskin, this is how he works. He moves from one idea to the next without any apparent order, but actually the imagination which leads him is following its own deep affinities and imposing a higher logic on him in spite of himself, to such an extent that at the end he finds himself to have obeyed a kind of secret plan. This should sound very apropos of Remembrance of Things Past too. So I would like to end with one grand passage from On Reading, from the first half, which I have, uh, which I have hyped up to you all as this example of Proust's style at his best. And so this is, um, this is my translation of that. And I would love to hear any of your thoughts about the translation afterwards. <coughs> so, so he is reading a book in his childhood. And he has these four long paragraphs of reading it in the morning before lunch, in the afternoon in his room, in the later afternoon, out in the park where he's supposed to be playing, and then at night when he stays up late, even though he shouldn't, to finish the book. So this is the second of those paragraphs. I, do I have time? After lunch, I took up my reading again at once. Especially if the day was a bit hot, everyone went upstairs to retire to their rooms which allowed me to return to mine right away, up the little staircase of closed set stairs. The room was on the only upper floor, but low enough that a child could jump down from the projected windows and find himself on the street. I would go to close my window, unable to avoid the greetings of the gunsmith across the street, who, under the pretext of lowering the awning, came out every day after lunch to smoke a cigarette in front of his door and say hello to the passers-by who sometimes stopped to chat. The theories of William Morris, so assiduously put into practice by Maple and the English decorators, dictate that a room is beautiful only on the condition that it contain only things that are useful to us, and furthermore that every one of these useful things, even an ordinary nail, be apparent, not concealed. Reproductions of a few masterpieces are permitted on the naked walls of these sanitary chambers, above the brass and completely uncovered bed, Judged by these aesthetic principles, my room was not beautiful in the least, because it was full of things which could serve no purpose at all, 
and which modestly concealed whatever objects did serve a purpose to the point of making them extremely hard to use. But it was precisely those useless things, they are not for my convenience, but rather seemingly for their own pleasure, which gave the room beauty in my eyes. Those high white curtains concealing from view the bed that was set back as though nestled in a shrine. The marceline comforter's floral bedspreads, embroidered coverlets, and batiste pillowcases strewn across the bed under which it disappeared during the day, like an altar in the month of the Virgin Mary under festoons and flowers, and which in the evening so that I could go to sleep I would carefully put on an armchair where they agreed to spend the night. Next to the bed, the trinity of a glass with blue designs on it, a matching sugar bowl, and the carafe, always empty since the day after my arrival on the orders of my aunt, who is afraid of seeing me spill. Like instruments of worship, almost as sacred as the precious orange flower liqueur placed near them in a glass vial, which I would have no more thought of profaning or even thought myself able to use for my own personal needs than if they had been consecrated pyxes, but which I contemplated at great length before getting undressed, afraid to knock them over with a clumsy movement. The little crocheted stoles which threw over the backs of the armchairs a cloak of white roses that must not have lacked thorns too because every time I had finished reading and wanted to get up, I discovered that I was caught fast on their little hooks. The glass bell under which, isolated from vulgar touch, the clock gossiped in private to seashells brought from far away and an old sentimental flower, but which was so heavy that when the clock stopped, no one but the clockmaker would have been foolhardy enough to try to wind it up again. The white guiper lace cloth which, thrown like an altar cloth over a chest of drawers adorned with two vases, a picture of the savior and a blessed palm, made that chest resemble a communion table, and this image received the finishing touch from a prie dieu tucked away there every day after the room had been done, but whose frayed edges were always getting caught in the cracks of the drawers and bringing their movement to a complete halt so that I could never so much as get a handkerchief out without making the picture of the Savior, the holy vases, and the blessed palm fall over all at the same time, and without stumbling and clutching the prie dieu to steady myself. Finally, the triple layers of light gauze curtains, heavy toile curtains, and heavier damask curtains, always smiling on me in their whiteness reminiscent of Hawthorne, often glowing in the sunlight, but ultimately very annoying in their awkward, stubborn insistence on playing around the parallel wooden curtain rods and getting tangled up with each other and caught in the window whenever I wanted to open or close it, a second one always ready whenever I managed to free the first to take its place in the joints, as perfectly designed to snatch it up as a real hawthorn bush would have been, or the nests of swallows who had taken it into their heads to settle there, so that the act of opening or closing my casement window, apparently so simple, was one I was never able to manage without the help of someone else from the house. All these things, which not only were unable to answer a single one of my needs, but produced obstacles, even if minor, to the satisfaction of those needs, and which obviously had never been put there for anyone's use, filled the room with, in some sense, personal thoughts, with an atmosphere of idiosyncratic preference, as though they themselves had chosen to live there and it pleased them. The same feeling that trees give off in a clearing, or flowers along paths, and by old stone walls. These objects fill the room with a silent and multifarious life, with a mystery in which my own personality found itself at once lost and enchanted. They turned the room into a kind of chapel where the sun, when it passed through the little red window panes that my uncle had intercalated at the top of the window, pricked at the walls after turning the hawthorns of the curtains pink its rays as alien and disconcerting as if the little chapel had been ringed by a surrounding nave of stained glass windows, and where the sound of the bells arrived so resoundingly due to the proximity of our house to the church. In addition, the temporary altars during the major holidays connected us to the church with a path of flowers, that I could imagine them ringing inside our roof, just above the window from which I often greeted the priest with his breviary, 
my aunt coming home from Vespers, or the altar boy bringing up some consecrated bread. As for Brown's photograph of Botticelli's spring, or the plaster cast of the unknown woman from the Little Museum on the walls and the mantelpiece in Maple's rooms, William Morris's only concessions to useless beauty, I must confess that my room had instead a kind of engraving that depicted Prince Eugene terrifying and handsome in his hussar jacket, and whom I was quite astonished to see one night in a great din of locomotives and hail, still terrifying and handsome, by the door to a restaurant in a train station serving as an advertisement for a brand of biscuits. <laughs> I now suspect that my grandfather had once been given the engraving as a gift from a generous manufacturer before putting it up in my room forever. But back then, I didn't care where it had come from. Its origins seemed to me historical and mysterious. And I didn't imagine that there could be multiple copies of the being I saw as a real person, a permanent resident of the room that I only shared with him, where I rediscovered him every year, always the same. It is a very long time now since I have seen him, and I suppose I shall never see him again. But if such good fortune ever should come to pass, I think he would have far more to tell me than Botticelli's spring. I will leave it to men and women of taste to decorate their homes with reproductions of the masterpieces they admire, unburdening their memory of the task of preserving a truly valuable image of those masterpieces by entrusting it to a carved wooden frame. I will leave it to men and women of taste to turn their room into the very picture of that taste and to fill it solely with objects their taste can approve of. As for me, I feel myself live and think only in rooms where everything is the creation, the language of lives profoundly different from my own, a taste opposed to mine, where I can find nothing of my own conscious thoughts, where my imagination is excited by feeling itself driven into the heart of the not me. I feel happy only when I set foot in one of those provincial hotels on Avenue de la Gare, on the Church Square, by the harbor, with long, cold hallways where the wind from outside battles and defeats the best efforts of the radiator, where a detailed map of the neighborhood is yet again the only decor on the walls, where every sound serves only to make the silence appear by shifting it somewhere else, where the rooms have a musty smell that the strong draft scrubs but does not remove, and that the nostrils inhale a hundred times in order to carry it to the imagination, which is enchanted with it, which makes it pose like a model so that it can try to recreate it inside itself with all the thoughts and memories it contains. Where, in the evening, when you open the door to your room, you have the feeling of breaking in on the life that lies scattered there, of taking it boldly in hand, when, the door having closed again, you enter deeply into the room and walk up to the table or the window. The feeling of sitting down with that life in a sort of easy promiscuity on the sofa that an upholsterer in this provincial capital has done up in what he imagined to be Parisian style. The feeling of caressing every inch of that life's naked flesh in the hope of arousing yourself with the liberties you're taking when you put your things here and there play the master in this room that is filled to overflowing with others' souls and that preserves the imprint of their dreams, even in the shape of the andirons and the design of the curtains. When you walk barefoot on its unknown carpet, it is a hidden life you have the feeling of locking up with you when you go trembling all over to bolt the door, of pushing in front of you onto the bed, and finally of lying with under large white sheets which come up over your face, while nearby the bells of the church toll for the whole city the insomniac hours of dying men and lovers. <laughs>